Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and can I thank all of you for coming to this session this afternoon, making regeneration happen in the UK. Uh, my name is Jackie Sadek. Uh, I'm the Chief Executive of UK Regeneration, uh, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. Uh, I am going to be looking for this session to be quite interactive, so I am going to be looking for some good questions from the audience. So if you can s please, whilst our speakers are speaking in the introductory session, could you please have a big think about some provocative questions you could ask our panel, because I'm very keen indeed to get as much audience participation today as is possible. But before we go on to that, and before I introduce the panel, uh, let me just quickly talk about uh, the context in which we find uh, regeneration in the UK. Um, the R word, by which I do not mean the regions, I do mean regeneration, nearly disappeared from our lexicon uh, in April 2010. Some of you, uh, the British people in the audience, may remember a very famous interview with Ed Miliband, who obviously was not at that moment in time the Labour leader, but was obviously destined to become so. Uh, Ed Miliband on the Radio 4 Today programme was asked uh, what the Labour, incoming, any incoming Labour government would cut uh, in view of the budget deficit. Uh, and his immediate response was the word regeneration. Now, for those of us like myself, I mean, I've spent 30 years in regeneration, this was a bit of a blow because what we then realised was it didn't matter which party was going to win the election, uh, we were, to use the technical term, uh, somewhat stuffed. Um, and we therefore began a rearguard action to try and, if you like, redeem regeneration um, uh, for the next decade and, and beyond. Uh, you all know that in May 2010 we got a coalition government in itself uh, a kind of interesting exercise in partnership working uh, and formed within five days, which was, uh, I think, something of a marvel in terms of coalition politics. Um, but we were very bewildered waiting for it all to happen. And as you know, our huge agenda now is the deficit reduction. Uh, and we're completely preoccupied with it. Uh, and, and there are other things going on alongside that in the socioeconomic and economic sense, such as, for instance, very, very burgeoning inflation, uh, which are, in fact, happening in, 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 in parallel. We've also been subject, uh, those of you who've been following closely, to a breathtaking series of policy changes. It's been an absolute roller coaster of a ride. I, haven't, I, could, I didn't have a slide big enough to put down all the different policy documents uh, that have changed. But for, as far as regeneration is concerned, Grant Shapps, who is the Minister for Housing and Regeneration, attempted to pull it all together in one admittedly incredibly short document, uh, which they're calling their regeneration statement, and that was put out on the 31st of January 2011. And at that point, from then on in, uh, we began to realise that regeneration was in fact about to be resuscitated, uh, that we were no longer in the naughty corner and that, and that things were beginning to come together. Uh, the Comprehensive Spending Review in uh, October had already announced that the Regional Growth Fund, which had been trailed at £1 billion, was, was in fact going to be £1.4 billion. That was clearly good news. Uh, we were coping with the idea of localism and big society. And for those of us that were involved in the, at the outset in bottom-up regeneration, that could have been good news, and we're still playing that out. So there's you know, potential for opportunity there. I have to say, though, the biggest shot in the arm that I've received uh, was the announcement on Saturday morning, just this last Saturday, of the creation of 10 enterprise zones in the UK. Uh, I think the exact uh, location of those will be announced in the budget for growth in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and the enterprise zones will mean there will be, there will be basically tax breaks uh, and incentives uh, to allow people to invest in these areas. And obviously the devil will be in the detail and exactly where the government chooses to designate the enterprise zones. But I think in terms of regeneration, the enterprise zones have to be good news. Now, I haven't as yet mentioned the local enterprise partnerships. I haven't as yet mentioned a whole raft of other things that are coming in because I'm hoping that my panel are going to pick up on an awful lot of that. There's been a huge amount of context and detail to try to absorb and I certainly, because as somebody who watches this, have had my head spinning really for the last nine months. But these are, uh, these are the guys to lead us through it, I have to tell you. Let me introduce my panel, if I may. Oh, what, what have I done? Oh, how nice, we have some sponsors. Is this my panel? 
so sorry, this will be me. It's operator error every time. Do I need to press? No? I just need to stop. Aberdeen and Fimit, thank you very much. OK, let me talk to you rather than wait for the slide. Um, it's an absolute delight uh, to have two representatives from local government with us. Uh, one very senior officer, possibly the most senior officer uh, in the country, actually. Uh, he won't thank me for saying that. Uh, and indeed, a very senior politician. Uh, and I, I'm going to introduce both of those in turn. Uh, we've also got two business people with us, and I'm going to introduce them as, them as well. So Howard Bernstein is known well to a MIPIM audience. He is Chief Executive of Manchester City Council, really bears very little introduction, and is one of these visionary civic leaders that the rest of the country uh, aspires to emulate, frankly. Um, he's decisive, he's worked his way up from the bottom, uh, and he's a, really an exemplar to us all. Uh, Neil McLean was, I, I think, um, a very serious and senior lawyer uh, until he was fingered by the public sector and is now um, the chair of one of our more, foremost emerging local enterprise partnerships in the Leeds city region. And he's going to talk to you a little bit more about that. He, he is at heart a businessman, though, and it has to be said that the LEPs are looking to be commercially and business-led, so that's quite an important factor there. Uh, Mike Whitby, who is leader of Birmingham City Council, again, is one of these kind of uh, legendary civic leaders, uh, needs little introduction from me, but is a lifelong politician who has devoted a lot of years and a lot of service to uh, Birmingham, that fine, fine city, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about, oh, rather a lot, I hope, about that. And, and Wilfred, the wonderful Wilfred, who I've only just met, um, has, has come to us a great partner to local authorities, I think already working in both... Uh, Birmingham and Manchester, has aspirations to work in Leeds, I think, so no pressure, Neil, um, and, uh, and, and is in fact already embarked upon the Olympics projects and other projects which he's going to talk you through. Uh, this is the energy dimension uh, and, the, and the partnering and the, and the green sustainability uh, issues that we need in order to sustain our cities going forward. So you can see that with the two business people and the two local government people and a little bit of mingling at the edges of all those people uh, that we've got absolutely the right panel for you. So with that, and, and the format will be that each of them will speak for about five minutes, uh, although I won't be draconian, I normally am, but these are pearls of wisdom, so I won't be draconian on this occasion. I will then be throwing it open for questions, and I would like, as I say, for you to all be as participative uh, and, and as provocative as you possibly could be, and as challenging as you can be in your questions, so please be ready. So without further ado, can I ask Sir Howard Bernstein to join me up here? Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, quite interested, really, in the analysis you gave at the start about um, ministerial views about regeneration. Um, like you, I've been involved in regeneration probably for too many years. Uh, and the interesting perspective for me has always been about what it means to different people. Um, regeneration for me is about how you make places economically competitive uh, for jobs and investment, and more fundamentally, how you actually ensure that the residents who live in those places are able to access the benefits of the wealth that brings. Um, I think that, at its simplest, is, is, is what this debate uh, needs to be about. And what I'd just like to do is spend my uh, five minutes as a contribution to this debate, really, is, is talk a little bit about three things. First of all, uh, what I see as some of the key challenges uh, facing particularly the bigger cities uh, in the UK. Uh, give you, uh, secondly, uh, an appreciation of some of the uh, key activities which we in Manchester, working with our partners, are working on. And, and thirdly, uh, identify those areas uh, where I believe there's um, some further work to do, both with uh, national government and other national stakeholders. So if I start off by talking about the challenges. You rightly uh, started off by talking about uh, the fiscal rebalancing exercise, which is a, a very uh, nice way to describe it, really. Uh, there are other ways of describing it, which I'm sure Mike will have even stronger views than me. But uh, it's absolutely clear that uh, the impact of spending 
uh, programs as a result of the CSR and what's been announced over the last few months is going to prove a very, very challenging uh, process and more particularly how local authorities uh, are going to be able to continue to prioritise growth in terms of all what they do. Um, the second um, big challenge for me is what I would describe as market finance failure. Uh, in the bigger cities in particular, there are still plenty of examples of schemes which are inherently viable but for a variety of reasons are unable to get over the line because of the inability to access the funding that's necessary to ensure those schemes go forward and more particularly uh, even when that funding is available to be able to source it at the right price. That's a big challenge I think for many of us. Um, another challenge uh, which I believe will become increasingly important over the next few years is what I describe as labour market productivity. Uh, uh, we all know that uh, people who make decisions about where they should uh, relocate, how they should expand, fundamentally address the issue of, of labour markets, the depth, the quality of those labour markets, the availability of skills. I believe uh, it's going to become increasingly important for the big cities in particular to actually improve the productivity of their labour markets. That means tackling worklessness, skills, increasing uh, independence. That's not just an economic issue. Uh, increasingly that's an issue which in fiscal terms we all need to come to terms with because we're not going to have the resourcing which is necessary to support the demand for high de dependency services uh, going forward. So how we improve productivity is key. There's changes in regional architecture, some of them welcomed, some of them uh, where the jury is still out. Uh, the loss of regional development agencies, I think, brings into very sharp focus whatever your view about the effectiveness of regional development agencies of, between what do we mean by localism and what do we mean by national, national delivery models. I'm afraid to say that all the evidence so far is that the loss of regional development agencies is seeing an even greater centralisation of activity, particularly in the context of those levers of economic development, which we all recognise as being important, whether it's skills, business support, trade and investment. And we're all having to live within uh, an ever-changing macroeconomic situation. Uh, some of us were privileged yesterday to hear uh, Jim O'Neill, uh, the celebrated economist from Goldman Sachs, give us a very sobering analysis about what the macroeconomic position will be over the next decade, uh, what it means in the context of what we were once describing as emerging markets and which are now racing ahead in terms of their own output uh, and where people like ourselves in the UK need to look at them more as customers uh, as never before. And I think the final challenge um, is when we talk about localism, what do we really mean about the role and functioning of local government? I mean good local government at that. We, we, we have uh, a major debate going on in this country at the present time and precious little of it, in my view, is about what is the role and functioning of local government and, in my view, how it uh, discharges its all-important role about shaping places where people want to live, where people want to work and where people want to visit. So how are we responding? In Manchester, in Greater Manchester, we are prioritising growth. Uh, most of our programmes now are about how we reduce uh, dependency, uh, how we actually promote independence and how we actually develop common assessment frameworks which enable us to make the reprioritisation decisions which deliver the biggest economic bangs. We're also looking at new investment models, uh, recognising that gap finance uh, is a thing of the past, certainly for the next few years, and how public sector investment can actually leverage debt and equity from the private sector in order to ensure that those many schemes which are inherently viable can get across the line. Um, we have uh, started to ignore local government boundaries, certainly in Greater Manchester we recognise that when we talk about a single labour market we need a single economic strategy, so therefore the collaboration in Greater Manchester is focused around how we drive our competitiveness and how we uh, support the productive labour market by working together in Greater Manchester 
and that's a body that will secure statutory force uh, from the 1st of April. And of course, we set up our LEP, uh, where business leaders uh, are working with us to set our strategic direction. That's not new, certainly in Manchester. I know it's not new in Birmingham, but at least it's providing even greater levels of institutional uh, participation, which I believe is important. What do government need to do, um, or others need to do? I think we have to start to prioritise those places, discriminate in, pla in favour of those places, uh, whose success is fundamental to national economic prosperity. That means London, that means Birmingham, that means Manchester and the other big cities because they can make the real difference in promoting jobs and promoting investment and therefore we need to move away from the one-size-fits-all approach to local government and uh, activities. Um, we need to allow our business-led uh, structures, particularly at city-region level, take on more responsibility for influencing skills, housing, business support, trade and investment activities. Uh, national delivery models don't work. Uh, we've seen, I think, over the last 15 years, plenty of evidence uh, for that. We have to create a real spatial focus on those policies so that those policies, those programmes are related to the needs, the circumstances of those individual areas and that, for example, where skills are concerned, we're training the people for the jobs that are actually being created in Greater Manchester or indeed other places. Uh, we need support about how we innovate around new investment models. Uh, tax increment financing is one way. Business rate relocalisation is another. Uh, we have got to start to understand that part of the public sector role is to work with the private sector and securing appropriate levels of investment in order to make that work. And that means recyclable uh, investment, which doesn't always sit easily uh, with the centre's views of local government or indeed local action. We have to create, in my view, a national and common assessment criteria about how we assess the validity and the priorities of different schemes and different programmes so that where we secure the biggest economic bangs are the places which secure the funding. And whatever new initiative we bring forward, we need occasionally to put the plug in on corporate memory. And remember that when we talk about enterprise zones, uh, and we saw enterprise zone in the 70s and 80s, they did little except uh, displaced jobs that otherwise would have been created in other places. What we need to be doing is providing added value and relating new growth initiatives to the generation of new business rates which can then locally be reapplied back into local areas. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you. A veritable tour de force, I think, I, I have to say. Uh, thank you, Howard, for an absolute canter around the issues. I think one of the things that we could debate perhaps for the rest of the afternoon is the role of local authorities going forward. Uh, one of the things Howard didn't mention is that the decentralisation bill, I struggle with the word, decentralisation bill does in fact carry uh, a general power of competence for local authorities, which basically means, um, as far as I can work out, um, local authorities can do anything at all as long as it's legal. Um, so a, a creed occur there for an empowered local authority and nobody better to give it. Um, so moving on now to Neil McLean, who um, is my new best friend, uh, a partner at DLA Piper, a, a firm I do an awful lot of work with. In October 2010, Neil um, was, was named Lawyer of the Decade, um, which is an accolade I, I wouldn't wear lightly if I was he. Um, and at the same time, I think, he was then fingered to become <laughs> the chair of the Local Enterprise Partnership. I'm not awfully sure that the two things were in any way related. Um, but nobody better to come and talk to us about Local Enterprise Partnerships. Just to say also, in, in introducing Neil, uh, Neil is one of us from our industry. He's a real estate lawyer, a property man through and through. And so obviously understands his inward investment, upwards, downwards, sideways and forwards. Uh, Mr. Neil McLean. Uh, thank you, Jackie. And if I may just correct something you said earlier, uh, unless my partners have been up to mischief whilst I've been away, uh, I'm still a serious property lawyer. <laughs> Uh, Howard has said much of, 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 I think, probably what many of us would have said in terms of the, the sort of macro issues affecting regeneration. I'm going to focus a bit more on what I think 
the LEPs are going to do, and I, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. Uh, you may appreciate the government uh, announced the, uh, the, the closing down of the RDAs and basically at the same time said it was going to create these local enterprise partnerships. Uh, it handily then said it wasn't going to say what they were going to do, what powers they were going to have, or whether they were going to have any direct funding. That of itself creates uh, some small problems, perhaps, for the LEPs, in that uh, there is no framework whatsoever around what it is that we are to do. Uh, in many ways, that's helpful. It gives us an open agenda. Uh, in other ways, it makes life slightly difficult in, in terms of what we should do uh, and what we should focus on. Uh, and without criticising the approach, perhaps the approach is best summed up by the fact that uh, last Tuesday, uh, the government announced that there would be an emergency LEP summit, which took place on Monday of this week. Uh, and we had the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, Vince Cable, uh, Eric Pickles, and the cast of thousands who were there to give us a lot of warm support, but I have to say uh, not much in definitive terms as, as to what, if anything, they were going, going to do to help. My approach to the LEP is we shouldn't worry too much about structures. We should look at outputs. We should look at the outputs that our communities need. My particular LEP uh, is 11 local authorities made up of councils from the three major parties. That of itself uh, is going to give us some issues, as you would probably expect. Uh, the LEP board has eight of those council leaders on, eight private sector, uh, and myself as the so-called independent but private sector chair. For the avoidance of doubt, I am a private sector chair. Uh, the concept of the LEP is, is that effectively we are the body that has to lead on the reconstruction of the regional uh, economy. Regeneration, in a hard sense, is a very important part of that, but regeneration in a general economic sense is an immense part of that. Every LEP will be different. If you are a rural-based LEP, you will have a certain sort of issues. If you are an urban-based LEP, you will have some very, very different issues. Uh, uh, both Howard and I were in a session with, with, with various mayors from around the country this morning, uh, and I'm a sort of the equivalent of a mayor in a soft sense, uh, which is why I was there. But at that session, uh, you know, we were hearing that the problems around the world, in many ways, are the same. Infrastructure issues are key. But you should not deal with hard infrastructure in an isolated sense. Infrastructure, to me, is what is needed to make communities operate and to make economies operate. You therefore, from, from my perspective, and, and I have to say our board hasn't yet met, so these are my personal comments which I hope my board colleagues uh, will endorse, uh, the infrastructure needs to follow the economic aims of the region. As a board, we need to be absolutely clear what those economic aims are. And that will inform and in some ways focus our views on where and what infrastructure is needed. Uh, I, I was at a, 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 a private dinner recently and we were talking uh, about superfast broadband. And the rollout of superfast broadband can bring huge economic benefits to areas. There was also a lot of talk about highway infrastructure, high-speed trains and so on, i.e. hard infrastructure. There was a very relevant challenge put, and that challenge was, if you rolled out superfast broadband, you would, in a lot of people's views, take pressure off the roads, you would take pressure off the trains, you would actually improve the carbon footprint. So rather than everybody necessarily chasing transport infrastructure, should people look at what their economies need in a very different sense. Now, it's never black and white like that. We're all aware of that. But there are a lot of questions that need to be asked. The other, way, the other major issue for LEPs at the moment, as it is for local authority, is, is where is our funding going to come from? At the moment, uh, the LEPs are funded by the relevant local authorities ma that make them up in an administrative sense, but the LEPs have no direct cash 
in the ways that the RDAs have. The LEPs can support at regional growth fund bids, ERDF bids, and we hope other funds are coming forward and the government are making announcements on other funds. We hope we will get some funds, but not for major projects. We think very much that the LEP and the councils that, that support the LEP need to be a facilitator. They need very much to listen to the private sector as to what that private sector's priorities are and then find ways of delivering that. And that can be done in many ways. Howard's already mentioned TIFFs, we've got local asset-backed vehicles, a whole range of activity that is being looked at. But local authorities, or at least many of them, can do a lot more to sweat their existing assets to actually stimulate activity. In, in Leeds, by way of example, uh, the, the City Council are bringing forward a development site uh, which is the subject of a later presentation at, at MIPIM this week, uh, in terms of, of creating a new office environment, some good spatial planning, some green space in the city centre. And that would not be happening if the local authority was not taking the lead. Uh, wearing my property lawyer hat, uh, I'm actually advising a local authority in our city region at the moment. Let me just say I was advising them before I was made chair of the LEP. Uh, uh, I'm advising a local authority that has a very substantial town centre scheme that is currently stalled for obvious reasons. Funding is short. The scheme was planned in boom times. It needs to be reduced. The developer there has already put in about 15 million of investment wants to stay with the scheme, but in a smaller sense, uh, but is not willing to put further investment in. The local authority there is funding the whole redesign of its town centre redevelopment. It's funding the planning application. It is taking that whole process forward whilst we're renegotiating a development agreement. If the development runs, the local authority will get their money back. If it doesn't, the local authority still has enhanced the value of its town centre because it will have a realistic and deliverable planning application. A very good example of how an authority can use its asset base to actually encourage regeneration and encourage development. And I'm seeing other local authorities do exactly the same. And the private sector has to be realistic as well, though. There is a shortage of public sector money out there. The private sector will have to work very closely with the LEPs and with the public sector. In many areas, there's been too much confrontational attempt to actually deal with regeneration and deal with planning. And we need to take that away. It's for the benefit of both parties to let regeneration take place. The local authorities and the LEPs need to lower the, some of the barriers between them so delivery can take place. I hear what Jackie uh, says, and, and again Howard uh, mentioned it, in terms of the new enterprise zones. I am strongly against the sort of enterprise zones that, that we had historically. I do not believe that they are right for what we need now. I'm very with the Centre for Cities in terms of the paper that they have put out that there needs to be a flexible agenda of benefits within an enterprise zone that different localities can choose from. I'm very concerned that the government appears to be deciding where those enterprise zones are going to be. That, to me, cuts a totally across what they are saying in terms of regionalisation and localism. The requirement for enterprise zones and what they need should be coming from the LEPs and the councils. It, we should not have the government telling us what they should be and where they should be. The government is also talking a lot about localism in planning terms. In a regional sense, I want our LEP and, and, and our region to be taking decisions across uh, local authority boundaries that are for the benefit of the region. We do not want those type of decisions being thwarted by localism at a very small scale. There has to be a balance. If not, development will, if not grind to a halt, simply not take off. There are a number of areas such as this where there are conflicts between different parts of government policy.
But if we can resolve those with government, if we can talk about sensible funding levels, if we can talk about cooperation between the private sector and the public sector to facilitate development, then it can start and it will be supported. Thank you. Well, I can see that me and the panel are going to have an interesting discussion about the enterprise zones at, uh, uh, at the end of the, of the, of the introductory speech, speeches. Um, my thanks for that, Neil. Um, interesting to hear about the emergency LEP summit on Monday. Uh, there's clearly a bit of a wobble of confidence in the LEPs altogether. I have to say, I think there'd be less of a wobble in of confidence in the LEPs altogether if people could listen to you talking. So thank you for that. Um, moving on now to Councillor White, Mike Whitby, who is... Uh, uh, the leader of Birmingham City Council, just doesn't need a huge amount of introduction from me, is a, is a Brummie through and through, has been a councillor for 15 years and the leader since 2004. But like all our other panellists, is a bit of a kind of hybrid between um, you know, public and private sector. He's a massive advocate of small businesses, been very, very powerfully behind the Birmingham City, uh, the Birmingham Chamber of Commerce uh, and the Federation of Small Businesses. So he really gets uh, the role of business and job in terms of the growth of Birmingham. Uh, Councillor Mike Whitby. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. And this is a very, very important debate because it doesn't really matter what the politician, who the, which political party runs the national government. It is actually almost insulting for a, a developed nation state to ignore its regions and the United Kingdom's economy is ultimately sustained by 60 million people and equally the nation state's economy ought to sustain the prosperity of 60 million people. And we all have a role to play. However, there are some salient lessons we have to take on board. Obviously, the United Kingdom as an economy in 2005 five was the fourth largest economy in the world. It's now purported to be the seventh largest economy in the world and predicted to, be, to decline even further. So by 2015, it will be the 12th, 13th, or perhaps the 14th. And the lesson we learn from that, all of us, is that nation states do not have a divine right to succeed, and neither do great urban areas and cities as well. So for me, as the leader of the city of Birmingham, the first thing was to find out what was the relevancy of Birmingham City, not only to its people, but also to the United Kingdom's growth agenda. How did Birmingham actually look towards itself, or rebrand itself, and become relevant? And the mantra we use is global city with a local heart. And Howard alluded to this, but this is a different way of explaining it. Once you've actually addressed how you're going to regenerate, and once academically you see where your prosperity will come from, it is essential, therefore, that people within a city are ambassadors of that prosperity because they join in and share that prosperity. So it's a global city. We're relevant. The city of Birmingham is irrelevant now to a family of international financiers. I do not look vis-a-vis -vis how other British cities are doing. I wish them all well. I wish every part of the United Kingdom to function on its six cylinders. But I see the real challenge, competing, performing, and attracting from the world a whole range of economic, um, cultural activity. But the local heart is about the population of the city of Birmingham, which is a million, and we intend to grow it. We've, we've now stopped the migration of our city people migrating out of the city. We've improved dramatically the quality of life over the last six years of the city of Birmingham. We've made city centre living vogue, and we're doing that, and we're capturing the young talents of tomorrow. Birmingham is the youngest European city through its young population in the whole of Europe. So it's capturing all that vibrancy. But what then do you say to the world stage? Because something else. Whilst half the world is suffering from illiquidity, normally, basically, that's British banks, European banks, and the, the American banks, obviously, there's a balance within the world's finance. So there are areas of the world that have a surfeit of liquidity. So the real skill, and the skill of not only the United Kingdom, but certainly civic leadership, is to align aspiration, generate a vision, and then appeal and attract the areas, the investors that are part of those areas with liquidity. 
And that is exactly what the city of Birmingham is doing. And what we did in 2007, we entered an international competition. We fundamentally entered a competition of 350 cities to fundamentally state with confidence the confidence we have in our city and also rebrand the city as, as a city of the future. We're a young city, by the way. We're less than 200 years old. We've metamorphosized ourselves more than once. What did tomorrow's city need to look like? And why would those areas of liquidity and of wealth come to our city, invest in our city, and dare I say, remain and live within our city? So we entered this international competition, 350 cities of the world entered, and in Valencia of 2008, Birmingham's big city plan was chosen as the master plan at the time within an international family of cities. And around that, what did we do? We said we will drive our city forward, we'll grow our city, we'll share the prosperity within the city, we'll understand the public realm, we will develop sophisticated public-private sector partnerships because it's more pertinent now, but even in 2007 and 8, we wanted to say, as a city and as a city leader, we own, as, a, as local government I should say, we own nearly 50% of the assets of the city. We're very powerful and wealthy, the largest local authority in the city of Birmingham. And even despite the public sector contraction of, uh, of budget, my budget is £3.5 billion. Pounds. And for every pound I spend, depending on what area I'm going into, there's a cost-benefit ratio that uplifts the value of that expenditure. So the big city plan was saying we are going to generate 50,000 new jobs, we're going to enhance and enrich public realm, we're going to use art, sport and culture as a catalyst for economic rejuvenation. But equally what I did, as I said, despite all of our historic relationships were mainly with our European cousins, we would direct and my energy would be directed to India, China, we have relationships with America anyway, but nevertheless, we'll resuscitate those, and the Middle East. And it's not by accident that in October of last year, we are the first city to sign a memorandum of understanding with Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi now is looking to Birmingham to advise on re, um, placemaking, but equally wants to invest significant amount of money into the city of Birmingham. Because Throughout the great cities of the United Kingdom, many of the projects of the 05 to 08 are in the doldrums because of liquidity, because of cost-benefit ratios, and the fact that actually they bought at the top of the market and they overpaid and the yield isn't there for the investor. So we're realigning the yield, we're talking about how it fits into the master plan, and we're finding international financiers. So Abu Dhabi, I was there two weeks ago, they'll be coming back very shortly. We have their sovereign funds coming into Birmingham and we're advising Abu Dhabi on how they develop their municipalities. We have Chinese money coming into the city of Birmingham. We will, be, we will restart making cars in Longbridge in April. And they've just announced that Birmingham will be their international R&D centre for the engines of their cars. Now, SIAC could have closed that factory down. But we sold them a vision of our city that had a global relevance. And they see Birmingham as a headquarters, not for the United Kingdom. They see it for Europe into America. Cities must have global relevance. But equally, they have to have a vision that is credible. And it's that credibility that will bring alongside people that may not be United Kingdom or British. They may not be European. It is a new order of finance, it's a new order of power. And unless the cities understand that, they will not tap into it. And then we will, we've got Indian money coming in as well. So we have three of the largest, fastest growth areas of the, of the world now choosing Birmingham to invest in. But equally alongside that, what is our relationship with the government? We have to have a relationship with the government. Because the bulk of our funding Actually, 73% of my 3.5 billion pounds comes from the government. I'm not immune from national policy. Neither can I isolate us from the ramifications. So that contraction of public sector money 
And dare I say, the downsizing of the people we employ, until recently we employed 55,000 people. Last year, nearly 2,000 people left our employ. This year, 2,480 people will lose our employ. And we've created what we call the Birmingham Bridge, and Howard alluded to it. It is the alignment of necessary skills to the vacancies and the sectors that are going to grow. And our LEP, Greater Birmingham, LEP and Solihull, and the City of Birmingham, in a new partnership, and we're saying to the government, for every public sector job that is, goes through the contraction, we will align it through our energy, through our policy, through our partnership, to what we believe will be two private sector vacancies. Now, the issue then is, will they have the commensurate skills and will they have the cultural understanding of working with the local public sector to go into the private sector? Now, that will be a bridge required. And we believe underpinning where we're going to go will be that concern for the people that want to make a career in the city of Birmingham, want to live within the city of Birmingham, that want to have a quality of life in the city of Birmingham, can be reassured that this is a city not only to do business in, but to live in, to enjoy themselves. And ultimately, they become the ambassadors of the city. You don't need a Sir Howard and you don't need a Michael. You can then have a million ambassadors saying, if you want to go to the right place, this is the place to be. And I hope for those of you that have never been, you come and see for yourselves. Thank you. Au contraire, monsieur, you always need a Mike Whitby. Uh, powerful stuff. My thanks indeed for that. And, and you'll see why Birmingham's got such a starred future. Last, but by absolutely no means least, we have our international dimension. Uh, Wilfred Petrie is the Executive Vice President of GDF Suez Energy Services. And he supervises energy services uh, throughout Europe, but I think particular, with particular reference to the UK today, uh, and works very closely in partnership with several local authorities um, to do what he calls responsible growth, which is a rather charming way of putting it, um, meeting energy needs, ensuring the security of supply, fighting against climate change, and maximising the use of resources. Clearly, there's a rich seam in that last part about maximising the use of resources. There is nothing not to like, I think. Wilfred Petrie. So this is a, a different perspective. It's a perspective from a private organization. And, and I must also add, uh, it's, um, I'm not the gifted politician as my other colleagues. So I'll have, I only have a couple of slides. I want to walk you through the, uh, the, the main... Um, main aspects of the challenges on energy infrastructure. Now, the, the, um, what are the, uh, the main reasons why I believe today uh, energy has become a, um, a key to these uh, regeneration? The, the first one is, I would have said a year ago, a couple of years ago, uh, low carbon. Uh, a couple of years ago, the, uh, the key to uh, developing new cities was uh, low carbon, carbon reduction. Now, with the rising cost of energy, that's one thing, uh, and I'd say even more uh, the last few months, I would have said uh, cost is maybe even more important today than it been. Well, I'd say low carbon is as important, but cost has certainly become on the front scene. Now, I would have said a few months ago, I would have said operating cost. Uh, now, I would have said, uh, I think I'd say uh, capital cost, operating cost, I think anything, unfortunately. So cost is certainly the issue. Now, what do we do to address this? Uh, now, the key word is smart, uh, smart networks. I think that's, that's very important. I think today, uh, uh, I think everyone agrees uh, uh, to have an intelligent system or an optimized system, it's better to combine uh, uh, the, the needs of the various buildings, uh, various uh, uh, energy uh, consumers to build a more optimized one. And in these, uh, these smart networks, there has to be a certain amount of uh, smart, uh, low-carbon energy production. Now, just to give a few examples, uh, we, uh, we do have a district energy scheme in, in Birmingham, which has a, a, a very good uh, combined heat and power production system. We have one in Manchester. 
as Jackie said, we don't have anything yet in Leeds. But I'm, I'm sure that's something which will be corrected. But we do have, in terms of L's, we have uh, London, where we, uh, we have a, uh, a system on the Olympic Park in Whitehall where we have a combined heat and power production. Uh, we have uh, tri-generation systems where we combine heating, cooling, and electricity production. We have biomass. Uh, and uh, we are uh, also actively looking at uh, PV uh, cells in Birmingham. We're working on uh, uh, biogas solutions. So there's, there's a large range of uh, new technologies developing today. And uh, the, uh, the key is uh, combining these uh, new technologies together into a, a smart grid solution. So it's something which um, combines uh, the energy needs of all, all the various energy needs of the different consumers on one hand. And on the second hand is also both uh, integrated between production and, and usage and demand side. So my second and last uh, slide is, uh, well, you've, you've heard of uh, LDP, uh, all the other sort of acronyms. Here's another one, the 3D challenges. Now, uh, we, uh, we uh, I don't know what recipe of success is. I'm not going to give you the recipe of success, but we believe uh, at least there are three Ds which are important. There's one in, in important in delivering something which is low carbon and low cost. The first one is, uh, is having a, uh, a system which has enough diversity. So when we, uh, we develop, um, we look at uh, these opportunities, we look at something which has uh, a good mix of customers, a good mix, a good mix of consumers. The good mix enables you to have a uh, continuous operation throughout the year. It enables you to have something which has, uh, by co combining these different customers, uh, a, a low uh, CO2 um, uh, emission. That's, that's one aspect. Uh, the other aspect is density. Now this, this uh, as Neil said, I think it applies to most uh, infrastructure. I think um, I infrastructure, I believe, is, is, is key to regeneration. And infrastructure will only be uh, at a uh, affordable price if there's enough density uh, to provide these services. So it's, uh, it's, it's obviously uh, essential to having a, uh, a system which is financially viable. Vi viable. Now the third one is, is uh, deliverability. Now um, I, I, I think maybe the key thing there is, uh, is finding the, uh, the, the proper agreement among the, the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, the, the, the systems we've been able to develop successfully are ones which combine a, uh, a city council champion. I think that's, that's key. Uh, it's, as I said, in those cities in which we are, I think it's, it, is, it is working well like this. Uh, obviously, the developers, the end users, and uh, we like to see ourselves uh, as the glue and I have among these different stakeholders. And, and it's important to, um, to have this glue uh, at the early stage of the development. The, um, the other key aspect in the deliverability is, uh, is to have long-term uh, certainty. The, um, this is clearly through um, uh, the, the permit planning, that's, that's one aspect. Uh, and it's uh, through the, um, the, the, the assistance of the, uh, the, the, the different players in this, both the uh, different st stakeholders, the city council and the uh, developers. Now, again, uh, maybe a, a couple of examples of uh, how this has been a success. Uh, we've, uh, we've invested about 100 million in London uh, on the, the new Olympic Park uh, in Stratford. Now, uh, there's one good thing about the Olympics is uh, something should happen in 2012. So uh, we felt that there, at least uh, the deliverability part of it, uh, the long term, well, at least something was going to happen dense and uh, diverse and deliverable by 2012. The, the second one, I think, uh, I, I'd say as a uh, Again, uh, example of success are the uh, those corporations we have in Southampton, in uh, in Birmingham, Manchester, in uh, in Leicester, which we uh, we developed recently, where there's a proper engagement with the uh, 
the city council for a framework agreement and a certain number of uh, key anchors to, to start to kick off these, these infrastructure. The only thing I haven't really addressed in, in this presentation, and in fact it's something which uh, did come through quite a few of these presentations, it's, uh, it's the, uh, the funding aspect. I think today uh, uh, there are a certain number of uh, cases where uh, a private organization can do the funding, uh, and as I said, the, the Olympics is, is maybe an easier case. Um, but I think it's very likely uh, the, the solution going forward on, on the, the new developments in the UK uh, will have to be a combined solution. It will have to be a combined solution. Uh, now, is it one of these new vehicles? Is the, the, the tax incentive, the tax uh, brought forward? Uh, is it the, uh, the enterprise zones? But there will have to be something where uh, there's a good combination uh, between the, uh, some sort of public guarantees and uh, some uh, expertise the, the private organizations can provide. This is, uh, uh, I think, uh, certainly a, a major new, new challenge. The good, I think the good uh, side of things is on infrastructure, there's clearly the, the appetite uh, for investment funds and for organizations to do something. But I think now we need to find the new solution on bring, bringing together the, these different perspectives, public and private. Thank you. As Wilfred says, there is the appetite, but can we deliver? We have to find the way through. Now, it, over to you, and I think there's a roving microphone coming around. We've got a very short time for questions. I'm going to ask my panel to remain where they are and get their handheld mics out and wave those around, please, if you may. Can I see, please see, and do be aware that this is being filmed for MIP, MIP, MIPIM television, so please, if you could get anybody indicating, if you could give your name and your organisation, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, can I see who would like to ask? ask the first question. Blow me down, you've been stunned into submission. Gentlemen here, anybody else who wants to indicate? Thank you. Okay. Yep. Oh, we're in. Ian Liddell, uh, WSP. I'd like to ask um, about localism and will it help to make regeneration happen in the UK? Okay. Is there any further... Excellent question, Ian. Thank you. Uh, any further questions before I go to the panel? Because I'm now running dangerously short of time and I have to be on time or somebody will come and kill me. Uh, what Lady there, in, fabulous. And then the gentleman behind her, please. Deb Tate from an organisation called Think in Place. Um, I'd be interested in the panel's view of how these three successful cities can share their um, aspirations and ambitions uh, given that lots of places, in my experience, have very um, low levels of aspiration, um, they accept mediocrity, um, they don't have a big vision, and at best it's a nice place to live, work, study, invest and play, which is the same as every, every other place. Um, so is the current government's policy, which is seeing lots of people leave local government, going to affect the quality and calibre of people in the politicians and the officers to be as ambitious as the UK's bigger cities? Another excellent question, I think one that finds favour with the panel, if I read the body language correctly. And then the gentleman at the back, and I'm afraid what I'm then going to have to do is ask uh, each of the panel to come back on that, and I think that's probably all we're going to have time for. So if I could ask you all, please, just to get ready with all your concluding remarks at the same time. Gentleman there. Uh, Mike Emmerich from Manchester. Um, I think in your opening remarks you were very flattering about enterprise zones. I think Neil was uh, perhaps r rather, uh -huh. rather less so. Um, well, I think it was Howard who started it, actually. Uh, I, I have to say, uh, I, I felt well, a groundswell against me from the panel. A, que enterprise well, zones. a question, really, because I think he was talking about how it's important that, that uh, enterprise zones should be locally determined rather than imposed from central government. My question would be, what's more important, whether they're nationally or locally determined, or whether if we're going to have enterprise zones, that they actually add to the, to the growth of the UK economy rather than just redis redistributing growth around to areas that really are never going to be able to cut it in the market? Well, thank you for coming. Uh, right, who wants to go first? I think what I'm going to do, Wilfred, I do apologise for this. I think what I'm going to do is go from, from, from my left to my right and leave the, the last word to Howard. Wilfred, do you want to say? You don't need to pick them all up, just pick up the bits you like, yes? Um, 
I, I'm not sure I'm the most, uh, I, I think maybe the answers for my colleagues will be more to a point than mine, but I, I just want to come back on one, which is uh, the, uh, are we going to lose skills uh, in the, uh, the public sector? I, I'd hope we're going to pick up more skills from private sector and there's going to be even more collaboration between private and public. Well, that was short, but it was definitely sweet. We liked it very much. Mike. Well, first of all, I think they're exciting times for local government uh, and the public sector. And I think equally the question about mediocrity, that is essential. No, look, and this comes from the media. You cannot accept mediocrity. You must drive that out of any organisation. So, sorry, my, my, I'm sorry, I'm, to get, I'm going to have to get bossy. Mediocrity does not just exist in the public sector. It exists, and the United Kingdom has to drive it out. There's no simplistic panacea. What we need to do, though, is look at the role play of the public sector, and if there is one area that the coalition government and the previous government needed to learn, and that is the Treasury should not take so long for regions, cities to have the prerequisite infrastructure to give them a chance against our global competitors. Now, it's taken I don't know how long in the city of Birmingham where we had a city station which was developed in 1966, designed to accommodate 16 million people, and we've just got the funding for it. It's creaking at the seams of 33 million passengers, and dare I say it, was not a good advert, not only for the United Kingdom, but for the region and public transport. So the Treasury, government need to know what uh, local government can do. We need to be seen as partners, not the cause for uh, decline. I know Howard and I and the core cities have advocated for at least eight years. See what cities add. And one of the reasons why we are behind our European and American cities is we didn't have the freedoms. We basically were castrated. And now that needs to have, we need to have the freedom, the alliance, the private sector need, that they can't take all the profits and we take all the speculation. I hate to see assets given away beyond par value. So let's move together, share the vision, give and complement the United Kingdom growth agenda. It's not about making Birmingham the greatest city in the United Kingdom. It's about making the United Kingdom a nation that contains great cities that are comparable on a global stage. Release the energy, to, uh, the funding to us. Let's not have the quangos. The, we had too many hoops and hurdles to jump over to suddenly say, this is how we deliver. We're delivering major infrastructure projects led by the, uh, the local government on time, on budget, we want partners. It's the government of the day, it's the private sector of the day. Give us that energy. I sincerely hope there will be cross-fertilization of skills. There's no, there's no one oasis of perfection will cross-fertilize. But let's respect what we add and let's respect what we give. And then ultimately, let's measure the out. Comes. That's what we really need to be measured by. Not tombs of philosophy and tombs of, dare I say, uh, economic vogue. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. Um, Neil, what, um, what could you add? Uh, Sorry, I don't know who's buzzing there. Right. I, I'll pick up a couple of points, if I, if I may. Uh, Mike mentioned in his presentation that, that he wasn't too worried about what other cities are doing. Uh, I have to say, I, I share exactly the same view. Uh, as far as Leeds City Region is concerned, you know, we're, we're a £52 billion economy, which makes us bigger than nine European countries. And we have a vision that we are going to play on the world stage. And that's what we are going to focus on delivering. Now, picking up the, 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 the issue of uh, the EZs, I said earlier, I'm actually not interested in structures, I'm not interested in the rules and regulations, I'm interested in outputs. And at the end of the day, I don't care whether the government runs the EZs or whether the local authorities or, or the LEPs are the principal lead, provided the EZs are supporting what needs to be done in economic terms in different parts of the UK. And I don't believe the government knows the answer to that. I believe the auth public authorities and the LEPs are far closer to knowing what is needed. Who administers it? Don't give a monkeys in the, in, in, in the proverbial sense. Uh, in terms of skills, again, I would echo what Mike says. There are some great people in the local authorities. There is some great talent uh, in the private sector. 
and I actually think if we can get them working more closely together, that will stimulate more talent in the private sector and in the public sector, rather than perhaps one of the perceptions now that is that you know that parts of the public sector do not have the greatest talent in. Parts of the public sector do, and that I think can be improved by working more with the private sector. My thanks. And Howard, the last word, I think. I think um, just two or three points, really. I, most of the points I would make have already been made. Um, talk a little bit about enterprise zones. There is no empirical evidence that was assembled in the 80s or 90s as a result of the implementation of enterprise zones, which showed that there was real added value uh, rather than just uh, displacement uh, of activity that took place. Now, I'm not against growth zones, I think, however, which is rather different. Uh, a growth zone, as we would define it, which is focused around specific places, which is designed to improve productivity, which is designed to improve outcomes where business jobs are concerned and which enables local authorities and their LEPs to redistribute the success associated with occupation, which is business rates, into those areas, I think is a thoroughly good idea and that's what we should be about. Um, otherwise, you don't secure any added value at all. I think one of the key points which uh, the lady at the front raised um, is our total inability, even today, to be able to discriminate between places uh, in this country, yeah. between places which are fundamental to national economic recovery. Uh, and we're all represented here, and if London were here, that would be the other uh, key uh, centre of growth. Because if we do not incentivise those places to achieve their full economic potential, then the nation suffers. And more particularly, you're not providing the benchmark for other towns and other places throughout the UK to actually raise their ambitions and aspirations as well. And finally, there is an important point about what the role of local government is. It's not just about doing all the things Mike and others have talked about, which are all very important. It's also about how we hold the ring with other public agencies who have a profound impact on our social and economic welfare, work programmes, skills, business support, trade and investment, which, but for our interventions, would actually be continuing to provide services which none of us are sure are at all relevant to the needs and opportunities are in our own individual places. My thanks. Uh, Howard Bernstein puts down the gauntlet that he's looking for empirical evidence on the efficacy of enterprise zones in the 80s and the 90s. I'm going to go away and see if I can find somebody to pick up that gauntlet. Uh, but I just have to, uh, before I conclude the session today, uh, thank all of our panel. Uh, I thank all of you for coming. I think we've had the most lively and provocative debate. It's exactly what we wanted. Um, I know it'll be written up in MIPIM News. It'll be on MIPIM TV. I shall be writing about it for the Estates Gazette and for the MIPIM World blog. A uh, fascinating debate. And thanks all of you for coming. But can I ask you please, finally, to join with me in thanking the panel in the customary fashion. Thank you.